Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. Today, we've got part two of our East Coast Rep Rap Fest coverage. And with that, here we go. So this is Aaron from Makers on Tap. And uh, who are you? I'm Rob. Rob, what the hell did you bring to today? I brought a huge Piper 2 tool changer. Um, I brought a smaller polar printer with a dumping bed. And I brought a smaller Piper 2 with tool changing as well. Yeah, these are all incredible machines. But this thing is just massive and ridiculous. So for those of you who don't have eyeballs right now, what, what, what is this thing? This is a, it's printing on a 24 by 36 inch mirror. So it's about a 915 build plate by about 760. And it's got 13 interchangeable heads, <laughs> nine of which are print heads, um, seven of which are direct drives. The other two are volcanoes. It's got a laser head. It's got a CNC etching head. And it's got a prototype uh, um, threaded insert installer, which we don't have working yet, but we plan to. So for those of you at home paying attention, this is the, the giant multi-head printer that we talked about a couple weeks ago that Rob earned the very first Hold My Beer Award on the podcast, because this is just an incredible machine. I mean, it's the most rep rappy thing here. Well, thank you. I mean, you. it's conduit. It's printed tool heads. How many ramps boards are you running back there? Five. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so tell me about the electronics. Like, like, why? Why all this? Because I can. Um, I made the smaller Piper and with tool changer on it, and I had so much fun with that. I'm like, well, what can I do to put more heads in the machine? Well, let's make a machine that uses meter by meter long rods, because <laughs> why not? And I got them in the mail, and I was like, holy crap, this thing's going to be massive. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, it has five ramp boards. Um, the top three ramp boards controls the, the nine print heads. Okay. The middle ramp board, which I'm... Of course, you guys can't see this, but <laughs> controls two CNC uh, um, drivers, which control the NEMA 23 motors for the XY gantry. And then the last ramp board controls the bed heater and the independent Z-axis leveling and Z-homing switch and everything else. Awesome. So you've got a couple of the multi, multi-print or multi-color prints here. And these are really good. Thank I you. I mean, for, for, uh, for a system that's built entirely on conduit piping and, and stuff, this is incredibly good. Well, thank you. Like easily better than any of Joe's tool changer prints. Oh. But that's more that's more of Joe than a, a tool changer problem. <laughs> I'm glad he's not here right now. <laughs> Poor Joe. So uh, have you done much with the CNC heads on this thing? No, I actually haven't even spun up the CNC head on it. I took it off of a crashed RC aircraft that I had. Yeah. Um, yeah, because that's, that's like a brushless motor on it. It is a yeah. brushless motor with yeah. an ESC and everything else plugged into it. Yep. Cool. Um, but I haven't spun it up, and I haven't fired the laser bolt to the machine. Um, but I plan to. The problem is it's inside my house right now, and I have a bird and a cat and a kid and my yeah. wife. And and you, could you're printing on a giant mirror, and you're yeah. trying to use a diode laser. Yeah, not, a, <laughs> not, a, not the smartest idea to fire it up. So there is actually a metal bed underneath the glass bed. Okay. Um, Still reflective, but less. Well, it's got blue painter's light. tape on it, oh, but yeah. There you go. But I was yeah. talking to a uh, gentleman here the other day that was today that was talking about ideas for how you can... Uh, Print on a black honeycomb to capture the laser beam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what bigger lasers do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. You've got a bunch of these. Uh, what are they? Badge holders, like retractable badge holders. Yes. Is that for cable management? So it is. Yeah. So that the <laughs> wires don't get in the way of docking the heads. That's hilarious. Thank you. Man, this is this is just incredible. Thank you very much. This is very much the rep rapiest thing here, <laughs> like the the true spirit of it. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, the polar printer. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it just finished printing. Um, it was made in about two weeks from conception to printing. Um, it's using a custom fork of Marlin that was a custom fork for SCARA printing. Oh, ah, okay. Um, but apparently there is already a firmware out there for polar printers using Marlin, which I didn't know about. But it saved me some time. <laughs> um, but it's... Um, the Z-axis is on pipe, just like the Piper Alex's Piper printers. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, we're about to release the files online and do a YouTube video on it. Nice. Because um, uh, everything's all open source, of course. Um, I think it costs us maybe about $125 if you were to buy all the parts off the shelf to make it. Nice. Yeah. So, uh, um, but yeah, it's it's been printing happily along all day. 
Yeah. Do you, do you have it working where it's going to rotate it off the thing and then it falls off? I haven't written the G code for that yet, no. Oh, okay. I need to, though. Okay. You're absolutely right. Yeah, because I think that was my favorite part when we covered it last time, was you could just, like, you can just dump it and yeah. start over. I need to mount a bearing here on the side of the printer to hold the bed down and then uh, just add some G code to spin it and recenter it once it's done spinning and start again. Awesome. So uh, where can people find you if they want to keep follow your projects? I have a YouTube channel. Okay. Um, so that's where I post everything. I don't really have a website or Twitter feed or anything. Um, I might eventually down the road, depending on how much interest we get, but it yeah. should be fun. What's the channel name? Um, it's my name. It's just Rob Mink. Rob Mink. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks for, thanks for sharing your printers, and uh, congr great job on, on the best, best, rappiest thing here. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>so this is Aaron from Makers on Tap, and uh, who are you, and what's this awesome machine here? I'm Joshua Vasquez. I'm from, uh, actually, I'm a grad student right now at the University of Washington at the Machine Agency Labs. Um, and Jubilee is the, kind of, my labor of love over the last nine months. It's uh, my take on a tool-changing printer. It's E3D compatible, so you can lock E3D plates as well as your own plates. Um, it's a little bit cheaper. It's also what I like to call um, fabricatable. The idea is that you can reproduce a Jubilee anywhere in the world without necessarily relying on a bunch of machine processes. So the majority of the processes are easy; or they're easily available. You, you don't need a lot of uh, uh, kind of finesse of hand-eye coordination to actually put the whole machine together. Um, and then the other idea is that um, with a set of instructions, you don't also need to necessarily be a machine designer to actually put it together to the same level of fidelity that a machine designer would be able to. So it's kind of a bit more of a kind of approachable solution to a high resolution uh, printing with multiple colors. Yeah. So what what sets this apart from like the E3D tool changer? Because it looks it looks like it's using some some common parts. Then you also have you know created your own motor mounts, which have really clever little set screws in it for tensioning. So like you know, so what are the little design features that you might that I might not be seeing that that yeah. kind of separate it? Yeah, so this printer was kind of this amalgamation of many good design patterns that I could pack into one machine with also adhering to the, the fabric fabricatability constraints. So as far as what goes in, there's um, three-point bed leveling with a kinematic coupling. That's uh, it's done with um, actually 3D printer replacement parts from a Delta. So there's little steel balls that yeah. slide into dowel pins. And the fact that uh, we can get by threaded... threaded uh, steel balls for cheap is kind of one of the benefits of living in the 3D printer ecosystem yeah. for, or, I mean, a decade after it started. So that's, <laughs> that's actually one really cool thing. Um, the build plate itself, as a consequence, can freely expand thermally when you heat it up, and it will just grow into the, into the shape of the coupling. So it has, doesn't actually change the angle. In addition to the three-point bed leveling done with a kinematic coupling, uh, one of the benefits you get from that is that you're able to um, do auto tramming. So when the machine first boots up and you zero it, it takes three points from the bed and then auto realigns it. That's a feature that's built into the Duet, but it's something that you can actually yeah. just you can just implement. So on I mean, Jubilee. that's what the rail cores do, right? Right, right. Yeah. But you've got the you've got the kinematic uh, couplings for the bed itself. Exactly. Yeah. The other nice thing about the kinematic coupling is you can actually um, it makes the bed hot swappable. So this oh, is something yeah. that I haven't actually explored yet. But if you have a quick disconnect solution for wires and you actually stack an assembly line of Jubilees side to side, you could drop a conveyor belt in, drop the kinematic, drop the bed down onto the conveyor, convey it over to another adjacent Jubilee, pick it up again and do something different. So the whole idea behind the project was that we want people to have the benefit of, of motion, of being able to do something, some sort of motion application without having to be a machine designer. Yeah. So I'd kind of describe it as like an API for motion. Nice. Um, yeah, so the extensibility comes from both the bed and the tools. As far as other little design features go, uh, the core XY belt pattern is something that, it's kind of my own take on it. I call it the flush form core XY. And both, any cases where the belts intersect with each other, or in any case where the belts are riding on top of each other, they are, they are flush, so it's a co it makes a coplanar. They are, they are, I guess they're in line with each other. Um, the other consequence of doing that, not only does it look clean, it's a little bit easier to assemble. So conceptually, you don't have to figure out what pulley goes to what next because they kind of trace each other back and forth. So it's a little bit easier for beginners when they're putting it together. Mm -hmm. The other benefit from that is that the um, belt tensioning is called out a little bit more easily in the back. So 
on my motors, those motors are actually put into slots. And then there are two set screws that enable you to just very finely tune the tension of the core XY so to bring it into um, equal tension. Normally, on other core XYs, I've seen people put the belt tensioning solution on the carriage, or they'll, they'll tie both belts together. And both of, those are, both of those solutions make it a little bit harder to actually get both of them into equal tension. It just makes it harder to assemble. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of those things, kind of a service to, to, to making things assembled, easily, easier to assemble. And then finally, um, the tool, tools themselves uh, are extensible, but the tool uh, is built off of a base tool template. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the parking post that goes with it is also a parametric design. So you're free to grow the shape of the tool plate as well as the parking post. Um, finally, when it comes to actually dialing in the location of your parking post, the idea is that you can actually fix it in hardware or software, but I picked hardware. And the reason why was that way it makes it a little bit easier for people to just download the config files. They don't have to muck about with G-code scripts. Mm -hmm. uh, what ends up happening is that there are two screws, or there are three screws actually, on each parking post. You move the tool into the quote-unquote would-be parked position, and then you adjust the screws accordingly up and down, left and right, such that you can lock that position in as the parking location. So yeah, that's kind of a collection of uh, yeah. things packed into one. So these little things on here in the parking post that the tool, that, so that's on the tool, is that is that called a flexion? Oh, uh, yeah, you're talking about the, uh, yes, yeah, so that is a, it's called a flexor. Yeah. Um, so the idea is the, the parking, when you park a tool, it, you need to actually hold it into place. Yeah. Otherwise, it might just fall out with vibration. Uh, so there's a bunch of different ways to do that. You can use a magnet. E3D, I think, uses a magnet. Um, I decided to opt for a flexure. Flexures are easy to laser cut out of laser cut Delrin. Um, what a flexure does is, um, it's uh, th the idea is that it's a uh, it's compressible in so in a in some limited degrees of freedoms, but not others. Yeah. Um, specifically, this is basically just a very simple one. That's just a leaf spring. Yeah. So it's just it's what it's doing is that it's just squeezing the uh, tool into the post and preventing it from falling out when it's when the whole machine's vibrating. Um, there are other fun places where you can use flexures. I have a different tool besides the uh, extruder tool that uses a pen. And the pen up and down motion is actually done with a flexor. Oh, that's so neat! Um, it's pretty fun. It's it's something that it's it's something that you actually have to see with your eyes to actually yeah, to appreciate. Yeah, that's gonna be hard to describe with words. Um, but the idea is that flexors enable you to move things along very set degrees of freedom. Yeah. But they're also very stiff along other degrees of freedom. Oh man! So my my pen tool, which has a flexure on it, can only move up and down, but it can't twist or move left and right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of one of the benefits of using flexures. But again, it's another design motif that I'd love to see people using. Yeah. Um, that's so cool. Yeah, and it's very it's very easy to do if you have a laser cutter and you're cutting laser cut if you're and you're cutting Delrin. Yeah. So tell me a bit about your uh, the locking mechanism for the heads. Yeah. Because the, uh, the the tool the E3D tool changer used to use a servo. Yeah. But that burns out really quickly, and then they switch to a stepper. But you've got a remote located stepper for yours. How does that work? Yeah, so kind of the way I like to describe it is um, if you've ever ridden a bicycle and you have bicycle brakes, the way your bicycle brakes work is that you squeeze on a little handle mm -hmm. and what you're actually doing is you're actually tugging on a cable mm -hmm. and that cable gets routed over a housing or a sheath over to your brake section where that, that change in length is actually being exhibited as a pull force on the uh, cantilever of your bicycle brake. And that's yeah. what's actually doing the squeezing. So it's very similar how this works over here where what we're doing is all I have to do to lock a tool or unlock a tool is move, uh, is twist something about a half of a rotation. So not even a full rotation. So what I decided to do is just run that, run a cable over on a pulley that sits on the carriage and w rope that over through a sheath over to a stepper motor which sits remotely on the frame. And what I'm able to do is take all the mass, all that weight that would otherwise have to sit on the carriage and move that onto the frame so it's stationary so we don't actually have to add to our weight budget of moving yep. mass as we're moving around. Exactly. The other nice thing about it is um, what, the way the E3D system works is it has a twist lock that twists. Yeah. And um, what they actually do is they have a axial spring, and that's going to that's gonna give you a preload that holds your tool in. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing is a little bit different. Um, the wire rope actually tugs on the twist lock, and that exhibits the twist force. Mm -hmm. But then on the remote tool changer side, uh, what ends up happening is that the, the sensor mechanism isn't position-based, it's actually torque-based. So the way that works is, if you imagine how, um, how a torque wrench works, mm -hmm. um, a, an analog torque wrench, 
what happens is that inside of your analog torque wrench, there's actually a spring. And as you turn your screw, as you're tightening down your screw with a torque wrench, what happens is that the you can see an analog dial, like a little needle move back yeah. and forth, and that's proportional to how much torque you're exhibiting on your screw. That's exactly how the Jubilee locking system works, where once I've actually locked a tool down, what happens is that the twist lock stops moving. But what happens is that on the remote side, I actually close the gap on a spring in the inside of the pulley, and that actually clicks on a limit switch located on the inside of the pulley. Where is it clicking at? So the clicking that you're hearing is, so what I'm doing right now, I'm holding onto the locking mechanism in yeah. my hand. Um, is it inside the pulley? The locking mechanism, yes. The, the clicking is, is coming from a limit switch that's embedded inside the pulley. Okay. Um, it turns out that in order to make this work off of the Duet G-Code, I actually had to wire two of these, of these in series with each other. So there's a, there's a limit switch for detecting the unlock position, and there's a limit switch for detecting the locking locking position where it has exhibited the proper amount of torque on the actual that is, uh, tool. That is awesome. That is so cool. I must say, this is definitely a lot easier to describe with pictures than with yeah. words. Yeah. But I hope the torque, the torque wrench analogy helps a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the benefits of actually doing this is that um, the tools that I'm using, actually the, the wedges that are embedded inside of my tool plates, mm -hmm. they actually will degrade over time. They're just made out of vanilla, PLA, nothing special. And so the idea is that if you lock down your tool with a constant torque, regardless of where your tool wedge piece is in its wear cycle, it will always consistently lock your tool. That's also the other, the other benefit to this is that if your wedge is a slightly different geometry, it will still be able to consistently lock it with a set amount of torque. This is why it's E3D compatible is that I can use my own tool plates with their own wedge feature, or I can use an E3D tool plate with its slightly different wedge yeah. geometry, and they both work because it's torque-based. Amazing. Where can people follow all this awesome stuff? Yeah, so right now I'm in the process of moving everything over to GitHub, but everything's currently on Thingiverse. We've got a Discord channel, which is just meant to help people uh, walk through the assembly instructions. If they have pinch points, if there's something wrong with the assembly instructions, I'll go and try to hot fix it as soon as I can. Um, so. Uh, the short answer right now is you can find a Thingiverse link. Um, there's a Thingiverse link to the main project there. When everything gets fully migrated over to GitHub, I'll post a little link in the top that says, hey, everything's on GitHub, mm -hmm. please go there. And what, what you'll find there is all the STL files. You'll find step files of the original machine. You'll even find the SOLIDWORKS files with the, all the history of the, um, of the design set all up there too. Right. Um, the instructions are pretty comprehensive. I did my best to kind of call out yeah, everything that's there. These are there. wonderful documentation, by the way. I'll, I'll be honest and say it's about 90 pages worth of work, but <laughs> uh, if you can understand a Lego set, I think you can yeah. build this too. Yeah, this is amazing. Awesome. Um, so what's your, what's your Twitter handle for people who want to follow you? <laughs> I'm Poof Junior. This is P-O-O-F-J-U-N-I-O-R. The whole thing's spelled out. Uh, I came up with that in, when I was maybe 12 years old, and no one on the internet took it. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for taking time to speak with me. Thanks this for coming awesome. by. This is this Jubilee is awesome. Well, I really or, appreciate it. I yeah. hope more people build it. I promise that there's some there's something for everyone to learn when they put it together. And I definitely learned a lot from all the revisions that I've went through to get this to work. So thanks again. Yeah. This is Joe, with Makers on Tap. Who hey, are this you? Is Paul Chase. I came out from Nova Labs to show off some old rep rep stuff. Brought out my original Prusa Mendel which has now been signed by Josef Prusa and Adrian Boyer. Nice. A true artwork. And the modern belt allowed a open source belt printer. She's up on my GitHub with very little instructions, but it's now working, so I'm trying to get people out there to look at her. So I have a bunch of questions about that. Um, mostly, what is the belt material that you're using? Oh, uh, That belt is stainless steel shim stock from McMaster. It's uh, 0.002 inches thick. OK. I think it needs to be thicker, but I have not yet bought thicker to test out. Okay. And the uh, on top of that is PET tape, the yep. green pet tape. I like it a lot better than Kapton. I use it on basically all my printers. I mean, that's been... <laughs> yeah. I don't like using the Ultem or the... Like the... Uh, PEI? Like the, um, uh, the build tack or anything. Oh, yeah. Because when you stick too well to the build tack... It's impossible to peel off, and I was afraid of that ruining the belts on the belt printer. So yeah, I'm going with this is not as good as adhesion. Sometimes good enough. Yeah, but that killed this bench. It 
<laughs> it fell off, and they don't work too well when they do that. So I really like this design. Um, I like your belt tensioning, and I really like. I even like this. Like this, this makes it things. Ooh, I didn't see that you had a linear support rod on on both sides with kind of the angles. I like that too. Oh, yeah. and I think <laughs> the main design on this is it's all bolted to the same side rails. Yeah. As long as these rails are parallel to each other, the nozzle will be, well, mostly perpendicular to the bed. Okay. And we use a laser cutter to locate everything, so it's one part that really requires accuracy. I guess for the center as well. Linear rails. And it's mostly inspired by the printer belt design. Mm -hmm. I actually bought one of those right before printer bot went down. And I wanted to scale that up. Okay. I do have a working printer belt. So. No, this I guy's printed for six days in a row making garden gnomes. <laughs> but still needs a bit of tweaking. And I'm fairly happy with it. But the belt tension... It's under quite a lot of tension, but it's not under enough tension. Okay. In my opinion, if you print large things, you can actually see the bottom surface is oh, not okay. as flat as I'd like. Okay. Good to know. If you print on a raft, then you pretty much eliminate any issue, but I'd really like it to work well without a raft. Then you got to fight that big raft, too. Exactly. So... The other stuff that you have going on here is super fun. Can you can you explain some of the things that are going on? <laughs> I have a. I'll, I'll post pictures with the podcast. Yeah, I've got so a few kinetic sculptures out because I love things that move. Right. And I hang out at a makerspace in Northern Virginia, Nova Labs, a lot. Okay. Uh, in Reston, so I do a lot of the booth for us, and little rings to give away. Tops. Got a chaotic chain machine, just running the same chain over big old ball dropper and a large printed ball machine and these guys are also up on the github so if y'all want to make it you totally can okay they're all running off of six volt motors powered by just usb very Excellent. basic a lot of the parts are somewhat large and take a while to print but they are very simple prints yeah mostly uh, i was looking at this last night when nobody was here and like this this is just really fun like i want this bolted to our wall in our maker space yeah just yeah. running forever um, so if, if people wanted to find your stuff, where would they find you? How, how do they find you? I've got everything posted at GitHub. It's github.com slash Painian, P-A-E-N-I-A-N. Okay. I have posted some of it to Thingiverse, but I'm mostly posting around the makerspace. I should do a better job advertising, but... Yeah. <laughs> That's how we are, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm working on instructions for the belt printer, too. I've got most of the bill of materials up relatively simple build when you see it. Yeah. There's a lot of little gimmies of, if you don't put this part in first, you have to undo what you just did. You're right. Very cool. Well, thank you for your time. Of course. Thank you. <laughs>